Hello, my name is Mary Coughlin, and I'm chair of the American Institute for Conservation's Collection Care Network, abbreviated CCN. CCN was created in recognition of the critical importance of preventive conservation as the most effective means of promoting the long-term preservation of cultural property. This means managing risks to prevent damage to collections, keeping temperature, relative humidity, and light levels at safe ranges, keeping pests out of collections, putting good policies in place to make sure collections are inventoried, secured, and handled properly, and much, much more. In this way, museum collections, historic sites, and archival holdings can be made accessible, not just today, but for many years in the future. The following video is one of three interviews that CCN conducted with the 2020 AIC Award recipients whose work specifically focuses on collection care. If you're interested in learning more about CCN, please visit culturalheritage.org and search for Collection Care Network. We strive to support the growing number of conservators and collection care professionals with strong preventive responsibilities and interests, so we always have many projects for you to be involved in. Thanks for watching. Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us. I'm Kelly Krish and I'm the editor for the Collection Care Network, um, which is the part of AIC responsible for collections care. And joining me today is Susan Barger, um, who is the recipient of this year's David Magoon University Products Conservation Advocacy Award, um, which honors conservation professionals who advanced the field of conservation and furthered the cause of conservation through substantial efforts in outreach and advocacy, which I can think we can all agree Susan has certainly done. Um, Susan is a consultant for small museums and archives. Uh, as a research scientist, Susan has delved into the chemistry of photographs and has written three books on the subject in addition to many other publications. She has taught undergraduate and graduate level courses in conservation science, the science of art materials, and the care of museum collections. She co-founded a nonprofit field services organization, Museum Development Associates, whose mission is to provide professional development training for small cultural institutions. And she has also served as coordinator for Connecting to Collections Care, so her voice will sound familiar to many of us who have enjoyed the webinars and workshops over the years. So um, thank you, Susan, and um, really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about um, some, of, some of your experiences in the field and um, any advice you can, can share for the rest of us to be effective advocates. So I think first, maybe the, the best place to start is, um, can you uh, tell us why it is so important to be an advocate for collections care uh, within the AIC community as well as uh, to the, the broader broader audiences? Well, um, I suppose the answer to that is it, if we're working in with collections, um, our job is taking care of those collections. And so we have to advocate for um, the monies to do that because those are always left out. You know, somehow if you have a museum or you have libraries are a little bit better or archives, um, the the funding for those activities of care are often just not even considered or or they're considered in a way that it means buying more boxes <laughs> or more envelopes but not necessarily um doing the kinds of things that would be overall care like taking care of the building or or making sure that you have storage that isn't full of bugs. So um, making sure the budget and the policies of the institution are kind of more comprehensive for collections care. Yeah, but in small institutions, often they don't have even those kinds of policies. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, in small institutions, collections care, as I learned, means everything. It means having a board that functions. It means making sure that people have training opportunities and that they're not penalized if they take advantage of them, that they have resources, that they have some kind of support. So it, it's a lot of things. And, <laughs> you know, it just, it, you know, a lot of times conservators were the, uh, the, the harbingers of no, you mm -hmm. can't, 
you shouldn't touch things, you shouldn't do this, but actually, you know, people want to take care of their collections and they're very eager to learn better ways to do it. And that's really part of our job. So it sounds like a lot of, um, a lot of balancing and a lot of creative thinking to, to have projects um, be effective and please uh, multiple stakeholders. Yeah, and my idea with these small institutions was that I wanted them to be a little bit better every year. Mm -hmm. That I, I wasn't gonna go in and say, well, <laughs> you need to do this and this. And I also helped them figure out how how they could collaborate with other people so they could um, do projects that they needed to do. But, I, you know, I, I had a feeling for the people I was dealing with. And sometimes, you know, that meant I needed to just keep my mouth shut and figure out a way to solve a problem. So I, maybe this is a good time uh, in your acceptance speech, you talked, uh, you gave some great advice on um, choosing the most interesting and adventuresome option and to consider everything experiment. Um, and it sounds like some rewarding experiences for you have been um, bringing these collaborative projects together and having people doing work that they feel really satisfied with. Um, and so I was just wondering if you could share um, either specifics or, or qualities of, of what has made um, uh, your career in collections care uh, most rewarding for you? Well, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't know that I worked on was Adobe. And when I first got back to New Mexico from being in the East, and I was a horrible Easterner, um, <laughs> But I came home and I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do here. And I, I went around and I asked people what they would like me to work on. I said, you know, I'm a material scientist. And the, they all said, oh, please work on Adobe. And I thought, oh, give me a break. Uh, <laughs> I just couldn't think of anything worse. Well, there was a, a big international meeting on Adobe and I went and I figured out that there was a problem that interested me that wasn't being worked on, and that's the durability of Adobe plasters. And so I thought, well, that would be interesting to, to work on. So I got some money from NEA, and I got hooked up with, the, with Cornerstones, and they were working on churches. I petitioned the Archdiocese of New Mexico to analyze adobe plasters that came off of buildings that the old plasters were being thrown in the arroyo. And, but I still had to ask permission. And I would go out and plaster buildings. And, and I would analyze these plasters. And I also did oral history interviews with the and Hadoras because plastering was, until very recently, was done by women. And um, so, and I also read up on what people said about plasters. And for instance, I had these plasters that were full of organic stuff and the anthropologist, or yeah, anthropologists had interviewed Anjadoras at the turn of the 20th century. And they said, you put, you put manure in these. And they would say, yes. But, you know, when I was looking at, didn't seem to be right. Well, when I was doing these oral history interviews, the place that had the, the, the strongest plaster was full of organic stuff. And I knew it couldn't possibly be a, a manure. And so I asked this old lady, and she said, oh, we would never use that. I mean, that would be awful. It would be gross. But they were, they were getting basically compost from the bottom of, of arroyo ditches. And that's what they were putting in their plasters. And the thing that made these plasters really strong was that they would form 
humic acids that would drink up carbon dioxide from the air and form natural lines. And it made them last a long time. And um, the report that I wrote for NEA -E kept getting passed around. So I'd go places and they'd say, oh, we have this, this report. <laughs> And, and, but they, they never realized it was done by a woman, you know, um, <laughs> which was kind of funny. I'd say, well, that's me. So actually the, the work that I did on Adobe kept coming back and I was able to go to Crater, the Center for Research on Architecture, uh, Earth and Architecture in France. And um, because of that, when it, the other people in my group was from Mexico, so I did work in Mexico. Um, I so I, I got to do a lot of things. I, I also learned there about examining architecture and figuring out things that that happen in buildings. So it made it me much more effective when I was dealing with architectural conservators on for caps. And also when I was going out and working at these small museums, trying to figure out problems, infrastructure problems that they were having um, that were mostly bad maintenance. So that had, you know, a big effect, but it's not something I would have really chosen had I not had a little push. Um, I guess uh, your, your story actually illustrated this quite well, but I don't know if you had any other thoughts on how conservation can better serve small institutions and other underserved communities. Um, you talked about the importance of professional development opportunities for them. Um, is that something that you feel, um, does the field need to make more accessible or have more opportunities or do you have other thoughts on that? Well, you know, for a long time, um, both when I was doing stuff for the state and then when, after we formed museum development, um, we were doing lots of training. And the, New Mexico is the largest state in the nation. And um, so if you have, if you have a workshop one place, even if it's if it seems it might be centrally located, um, people might have to travel six or eight hours to get to a workshop. And then that means they might also have to spend the night or two. And um, so even though we usually charged, we would find money to basically support the workshops, we, uh, we, we had people coming to us and saying, I, I can't afford to go to workshops because we can't afford to travel. Can't you do them without travel? So, um, or they would also say, you know, my board won't let me come to workshops because I might be away for two days and they don't have anything to show. I don't have anything to show when I get back that I got this training. So that was one of the reasons why we started Small Museum Pro, which is now part of ASLH. And um, to get that started, I applied for money at IMLS, which we, didn't, we did not get because they said we didn't have the capacity, um, which is probably true. Um, I also uh, lobbied the, architect the legislature um, I became a registered lobbyist, <laughs> and I'd have to make my report about the five dollars I spent to lobby every year. Um, I didn't realize uh, you had registered as a lobbyist, even. That's um, to, that's really order, taking ad advocacy far. Well, in order to talk to people in the legislature, I had to register. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I I was able to get money from the legislature that enabled us to start Small Museum Pro through Eastern New Mexico University. 
um, which happened to have one of the oldest distance education programs in the country. And so that program, basically, it helped us solve the distance problem. And it also, because we could use the certification through Eastern Mexico, people could get a certificate. And if they did all the classes, there were five classes, they would get something that said they were a small museum pro. And when museum development went out of business, uh, we basically gave that to ASLH. And it's still running. I'm really pleased about it. That's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. I, so I think that also gets to um, how, how can, how should we, how should we be working to um, evolve professional development opportunities uh, into the future to better serve uh, a wide variety of, of needs and to reach everyone? Well, I, I think that programs like um, Connecting to Collections Care, um, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to run it, can, can provide a lot of assistance. Um, and I see that a lot of other institutions are now providing um, distance learning, basically. Um, I think that asking people what it is that they need and really understanding what it is that they're telling you that they need. Because a lot of times you'll say, well, do you need X? And they'll say, oh, yeah. <laughs> because they're afraid to say to you, no, I really need Y. Hmm. And you need to try to figure out what, uh, what they're saying their needs are and what their needs really are, and then how you can fulfill them. And, you know, when AIC took over Connecting to Collections Care and CAP, those were really the first two programs that AIC had that were um, reaching out of the profession, reaching to non-conservation types. And, you know, at first, um, people were thinking that Connecting to Collections Care would be a, an opportunity for, an employment opportunity for emerging uh, professionals. <laughs> and, and I'd say, you know, I'm really happy if that happens, but that's not our audience. Mm -hmm. Our audience is these people outside of the profession. And I beat that drum a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that might be a good place to end. Um, thank you so much for your time and for sharing that. I feel like I, um, I learned a lot from, from hearing about your experiences and everything. That was, that was really interesting. So I, I really appreciate you um, speaking with us and taking the time.